Hi, my name is Shubashish Chatterjee from the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and Joseph Rabin from the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And on behalf of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Critical Care Workforce, we're pleased to discuss the topic of vasoplegic shock and latest management strategies. We'll begin by discussing what vasoplegic shock or vasoplegia is, its outcomes, relevant risk factors. We'll talk about vasopressor management, vasopressin itself, norepinephrine, and angiotensin II utilization. We'll talk about salvage strategies that might be available, and we'll try to summarize this all for a uh, management algorithm. So the definition of vasoplegic shock is variable, and it's there's a lot of heterogeneity within the literature, but the consensus definition is, describes it as a refractory hypotension characterized by a mean arterial pressure in the 60 to 65 range, a cardiac index that's high, anything greater than 2.2 to 2.5, a low systemic vascular resistance, and quote unquote, the need for high dose vasopressors. Depending on how this is defined, the prevalence exists anywhere between 10 to 40% of the time after cardiac surgery. And we know the outcomes are certainly adverse with a three to five fold increase in mortality. There are also certain risk factors that have been associated with the development of vasoplegia after cardiac surgery. Most commonly, this is associated with renal failure or long operation. So patients with previous cardiac surgery, long pump time, long clamp time, and basically long combined surgeries are the patients most at risk of developing vasoplegia. Now, most of the literature in vasoplegia is in the field of sepsis. There are a few trials that describe it in vasoplegic, vasoplegic shock after cardiac surgery. The most famous and only randomized trial that exists is the VANCS trial, V-A-N-C-S, which is characterized by describing the use of monotherapy with vasopressin versus norepinephrine. This was a Brazilian trial of 300 patients, about half isolated cabbage and half valve surgeries. And what, in terms of uh, reaching the primary endpoint, which was event-free survival or the development of primary complications, the very vasopressin group clearly had superior outcomes to the norepinephrine group. When you look closely, however, you'll also see that the mortality in this group was comparable, approximately 15%, in a very low-risk cohort. The key differences between these two were a much lower incidence of acute renal failure in the vasopressin group and a much lower incidence of atrial fibrillation in the vasopressin group. When we look at a large systematic review published in 2018 that looked at predominantly sepsis vasoplegia, but approximately two studies that uh, dealt with cardiac surgery, we see that the combination of vasopressin plus norepinephrine in general tended to have better outcomes than norepinephrine alone. We see that in mortality, the relative risk reduction was approximately 10% less with the number needed to treat of 25. We see that in atrial fibrillation, the relative risk reduction was almost 25% with the number needed to treat of 12. And we see no major difference in renal replacement therapy. So certainly the combination of vasopressin plus norepinephrine has advantages to monotherapy itself. What we also have in our armamentarium in the last two to three years is angiotensin II. The ATHOS-3 trial demonstrated that angiotensin II, which is a naturally occurring physiologic substance, clearly had a significantly improved outcomes with respect to uh, achieving amino arterial pressure of at least 75 and a significant reduction of vasopressors. So this angiotensin II is certainly our third line in terms of refractory vasoplegia to be able to achieve a sustainable mean arterial pressure. Now we look at adjunctive therapies that may be associated uh, with benefit. And again, most of this literature is largely derived from the sepsis experience. So with respect to steroids, so in general, glucocorticoid therapy, and then this is the adrenal trial that came out two years ago, but there are three other trials which all describe the same thing, which is that there's no mortality benefit to glucocorticoid therapy, but there is a faster resolution of shock, decreased vasopressors, and more improved hemodynamics. On the other side, on the right, you'll see uh, hydrocortisone plus mineralocorticoid. 
uh, in the approaches trial, also in 28. And here you'll actually see a mortality benefit. In addition, you'll also see a faster weaning of vasopressors in the steroid group. So it's been our practice to be able to use combination glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids when we utilize steroids. With respect to methylene blue, methylene blue has been around for a while and it's often used in salvage strategies. You do have to be careful about using it uh, in patients with MAOI or SSSR. I, uh, you know, anti-depression uh, medications for the risk of developing serotonin uh, syndrome. Uh, but the primary benefits of methylene blue, at least in published reports, does suggest that there may be some benefit in, the, in uh, a number of patients. Here's some published experiences. Most of these series tend to give them as a single bolus dose. There are other experiences where people have published uh, using it not only as a single bolus dose, but also then as a continuous infusion. So there are different strategies of how to be able to use methylene blue. With respect to other adjunctive medications, hydroxycobalamin or vitamin B12, which is also known as cyanokin, given it most commonly for cyanide toxicity. This is a five gram, a single dose that's given intravenously. There are a number of reports throughout the literature after post-cardiac surgery vasoplegia for, be able, for being able to improve hemodynamics. In addition, what is probably one of the most popular and in most investigated aspects in the sepsis literature is ascorbic acid or vitamin C. There are a couple of, uh, here's a case series from uh, describing uh, the use of vitamin C after post-cardiac surgery, uh, vasoplegia with satisfactory outcomes. So finally, we get to where our algorithm is today. And so before, we used to have sort of a hodgepodge. We would try a lot of different things. But today, where we stand is we first start with norepinephrine. Once we get to approximately five mics per kilo, five mics per minute, we then initiate vasopressin. And once we achieve that, if we're able to get a target mean arterial pressure, probably closer to a map of 70 or so, then we're satisfied. If we're unable to do that, we initiate angiotensin II and we achieve our target mean arterial pressure. Now, cost is a relevant consideration. For one day, norepinephrine costs about $30 a day, vasopressin costs about $400 a day, and angiotensin II costs about $1,400 a day. So our algorithm is angiotensin II is the last on, but the first off, and that's our algorithm for how we approach it. Once we achieve a target mean arterial pressure, however, we then try to move towards other adjunctive treatments. We'll try to correct alcedemia or calcium uh, and utilize that, as well as early initiation of CRT if it's necessary. We tend to use both glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids in the doses given. We have a low threshold to initiate that. We'll also use vitamin C and thymine in appropriate candidates. And then we will occasionally use methylene blue and hydroxycobalamin. There's some recent data that suggests that combination methylene blue plus hydroxycobalamin is better than just using uh, one of these medications alone. So with that, vasoplegia is a very difficult challenge and it is associated with a high mortality. But newer medications and a systematic approach can offer the clinician a meaningful opportunity to be able to uh, address this problem. Thank you.